Tricky Topics video series. Operant conditioning. Operant conditioning involves what most people call trial and error learning. This type of learning follows certain rules, and this knowledge has allowed us to manipulate conditions to reinforce desired consequences. In fact, it's a powerful tool that allows us to collaborate with other animals. Operant conditioning is one type of associative learning, where an individual makes a connection between two different stimuli or events. More specifically, it's learning about the consequences of actions, so it's based on voluntary, deliberate behaviors or learning by choosing. What are some examples? Imagine you just got a new phone after years of struggling with your old one. You decide to text everyone to let them know the good news. You have a general idea of how it works, so you take the instruction booklet that came with it and chuck it in the recycling bin. You're going to figure it out all on your own by making voluntary responses, like tapping on buttons, and observing the consequences. If a response results in an unwanted outcome, it's less likely you'll do that in the future. If another response leads to a favorable outcome, then it's more likely to be repeated in the future. Some of the earliest research in this field was done by E. L. Thorndike in the early 1900s. Thorndike proposed his Law of Effect, which states that the consequences of a behavior increase or decrease the likelihood of it being repeated. This theory was based upon his research with cats in a puzzle box. A cat was placed in a box with a lever-operated door, and tasty salmon was placed on the other side. By trial and error, the cats all managed to escape the box by trying different behaviors, and the ones that resulted in desirable outcomes, like pressing a lever that opens a door, were repeated. After a few trials in the puzzle box, the cats escaped very quickly, once they figured out the best response. B.F. Skinner later coined the term operant to mean any action that operates on the environment to produce specific consequences. He invented the operant conditioning chamber, which is usually called a Skinner box. This is an improvement over Thorndike's puzzle box because it's designed to measure and manipulate many behaviors. Animals tested in a Skinner box can make many responses to obtain their desired outcome, such as pressing a lever multiple times, compared to only one response, escape, in Thorndike's puzzle box. This is an important innovation because it enables researchers to measure complex concepts, such as the effort an individual is willing to put into a task, by measuring the number of responses they're willing to make for a particular consequence. For instance, we know that a hungry rat will make more operant responses for food than a recently fed one, which tells us something about the differences in their motivation for food. The Skinner box has been used in many areas of psychology and neuroscience, because motivated behavior is important for so much. Feeding, mating, memory, intelligence, you name it. So here are some examples of operant behaviors, their consequences, and the outcome on future behavior. Let's examine two behaviors that you might be familiar with. If you post a picture of your cat on Instagram, you might be rewarded with loads of likes. This behavior resulted in a win for you, so you'll probably post more cat photos in the future. How about your morning coffee? If your coffee gives you a jolt so you feel more awake and alert, and this helps you start your day, you're likely to continue your morning coffee drinking. Are there rules that govern how we respond to consequences? Sure, lots of them. Through years of research by Skinner and others, we are still learning how this type of learning works. The most basic rule is whether a consequence strengthens or weakens behavior. Reinforcement is when a consequence increases the occurrence of a future behavior, whereas punishment is when a consequence decreases the occurrence of a behavior. Reinforcement and punishment both come in two flavors, positive and negative, depending upon whether a stimulus is presented or removed. Positive reinforcement is when the behavior results in the addition of a desirable outcome, such as feeling great after exercise. People who feel good after exercising will likely repeat that behavior in the future. 
Negative reinforcement occurs when we respond to get rid of something undesirable, such as buckling a seatbelt to get rid of the annoying buzzing alarm. Positive punishment is when a behavior results in the addition of something undesirable. An example is parking in a no parking zone and getting a ticket. This makes that behavior less likely to be repeated in the future, lesson learned. Negative punishment is when a behavior results in the loss of something desirable, such as when a kid uses bad language where their parents can hear and they lose all screen time for the day. The intent of this is to reduce the swearing behavior. Reinforcers are rewards or incentives that guide behavior in the direction so we get what we want. But what do we want? There are some reinforcers that are universal and that everyone finds them innately rewarding or aversive. Primary reinforcers are those that don't require prior learning, since they satisfy some biological need. An example of a positive primary reinforcer is food, especially when we're hungry and the food is tasty. Pain is a universal primary negative reinforcer in that all animals engage in behaviors to reduce or avoid it. Secondary reinforcers, also called condition reinforcers, are not inherently rewarding or aversive. They're meaningful because they're associated, from past experience, with a primary reinforcer. A fantastic example of a positive secondary reinforcer is money, like these bills here. If I told you that you could pick one, you'd probably take the hundred, since it's worth more money, rather than the much prettier fifty or ten dollar bills. An example of a negative secondary reinforcer is a low grade on a test, which should hopefully strengthen studying behavior to avoid getting this grade on the next test. Understanding operant conditioning is useful in real life, as anyone who has tried to train a dog will tell you. Our knowledge of how operant learning works has allowed us to tap into the superpowers of other animals, like dogs' amazing sense of smell. By rewarding detection of certain substances, like explosives, with a treat, dogs can operantly learn about behaviors and consequences in a way to make us safe. A combination of threats and bribes are quite often used to shape the behavior of lots of animals, including humans, as every parent knows. Addictive drug-seeking and drug-taking behaviors also follow the rules of reinforcement and conditioning. So many successful treatments incorporate classical and operant conditioning principles to untrain problematic behaviors. Operant conditioning allows us to make decisions based on how past behaviors worked out. Knowing the principles of reinforcement and punishment are powerful tools in training ourselves and other animals.